On this day in 1829, the body of John Brungar lay in a morgue in Sydney awaiting dissection, having gone to the gallows on the previous morning for murdering William Perfoot at Moreton Bay. Whilst by today's standards, the concept of dissection seems ghastly, in convict era Australia, it was par for the course, if you were an executed prisoner. A native of Kent in England, Brungar had been convicted at the Kent Assizes on the 2nd of August 1819 and was issued with a life sentence which would ensure his transportation to the colony of Australia. After four long months of transportation aboard the Prince Regent, Brungar arrived in Sydney Cove on the 27th of January 1820 into the capable hands of the colony's convict authorities. Unfortunately, the bulk of Australia's archive convict material was destroyed after the cessation of convict transportation. However, enough still exists that we can trace John Brungar's movements after reaching our shores. For a start, we know that after spending over a year in the vicinity of Sydney, Brungar was brought up on charges at Parramatta on the 19th of March 1821, an event which saw another two pointless years added to his already previous life sentence. Ten days later, Brungar was loaded onto the transport Elizabeth Henrietta for relocation to Newcastle. In January 1821, Four months after being relocated to Newcastle, Brungar's fortunes turned again. After being issued as a convict servant to a master, generally a landowner of note, Brungar had chosen to abscond and took to the bush, a poorly concocted decision as he was located soon after. For his dissidence, he was sentenced to suffer 50 lashes, a physical punishment that would have tested even the strongest of men. The punishment seemed to slow John's self-destructive nature for a time, as his record remains clear for a few years, until again absconding in June 1823. Located again shortly after, Brungar was sentenced to a further 75 lashes for his indiscretions. In 1824, Brungar was moved to the employ of James McGillivray, employment that again lasted two months before Brungar was brought up on charges and sentenced to yet another seven pointless years. It was now clear that John was a perfect subject for transportation north to the experimental Moreton Bay penal settlement. Transported to Moreton Bay, Brungar's activities remain unclear until the 27th of September, 1828, when his movements brought him into contact with another convict by the name of William Perfoot. The two men, as part of a much larger convict gang, had been working on the foundations for the Moreton Bay Penal Settlement's new commissariat store on the banks of the Brisbane River overlooking the fledgling outpost's wharf. Brungar was aware that Perfoot possessed a lighter mattock and had been manoeuvring unsuccessfully all morning to sequester it for his own use. When Perfoot again refused to hand his mattock over, a slight physical tussle began between the two prisoners and the convict overseer demanded that Brungar move to the other side of the excavation, an order he obeyed until midday, when his frustration finally took the better of him. Turning to face Perfoot, who was stooping down at the time, Brungar sprinted across the pit with his mattock and struck his adversary in the head. The blade of the mattock penetrated Perfoot's skull to a depth of about two inches and felled him where he stood, apparently dead. Brungar immediately dropped his mattock, picked up a shovel and continued on working as if nothing had happened at all, despite his crime having been witnessed by everyone present. Perfoot's limp frame was immediately loaded into a wheelbarrow, conveyed at once to the convict hospital which stood where the old magistrate's building existed up until recently. Here, under conditions that would barely class as sanitary under current day standards, Perfoot languished for a remarkable six days before finally passing away from his horrific injury. Shortly after, Brungar was pinioned and transported back to the administrative settlement of Sydney to await trial. Subsequently sentenced to death after trial in early April 1829, Brungar's execution was scheduled for the 16th of the month. 
On that morning, a large crowd gathered in the hopes of catching a glimpse of the condemned man hitting the end of the hangman's rope. Unfortunately for the morbid curiosity, Brungar was given a respite literally on the walk to the gallows as the order for his execution had not arrived at the jail in time. The date for his execution was postponed for two days until the 18th of April. Standing on the gallows, alongside two other men earmarked for execution, Brungar stated to all who would listen, I die innocently before you all and now about to suffer. I declare my innocence. Had I been allowed to have my witnesses up from Morton Bay, I should have been cleared. I now solemnly declare my innocence, but I am willing to suffer. With that, Brungar was launched into eternity, the papers reporting that a few convulsive quiverings and death terminated his mortal career.